Is Jesus going to return to this earth and reign for a thousand years from Jerusalem in what is called the Millennium? Many people are surprised to discover that the vast majority of Christendom, both Catholic and Protestant, say no. That view is called amillennialism, meaning no millennium. Stay tuned for a discussion of this very important issue. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. I have in the studio with me today two of my colleagues, Nathan Jones, who is our internet evangelist, and Tim Moore, who is our associate evangelist and my designated successor. Gentlemen, let's jump right into this and so we can cover as much as we possibly can. Right. And the first question that I want to deal with here is this one. If the Bible says point blank in Revelation 20 that Jesus is going to reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years, how in the world does the majority of Christendom, both Catholic and Protestant, come to the conclusion that will not happen? Well, I think first of all that uh, sometimes too many in Christendom itself dismiss the entire book of Revelation. Yeah. Or they say, well, we can't look at that part of Revelation as being literal. It has to be spiritualized. And so they come up with fanciful interpretations of how that doesn't mean what it says when the Lord talks about coming and reigning for a thousand years. Well, it depends on how you interpret by exactly. It's you either spiritualize it like many people do Revelation. They get to Revelation 20 and it's where six times it says that a thousand years, that Jesus' King will be a thousand years. So it's not just one place or one time, it's six times, right? And so you can spiritualize and say, well, that just means that a day for Jesus is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day, which is like, not, you know. And so then they spiritualize, say, well, that doesn't really mean a thousand years. But you and I, we take it literally. So we go by the golden rule of interpretation that if the plain sense makes sense, look for no other sense, lest you end up with nonsense. And it says a thousand years, and that's what the Bible says, not just once, but six <laughs> times. So I'm going to take it literally. And another point we might make is that all the first coming prophecies meant exactly what they said. That should be a guideline for the second coming prophecies. Exactly. 109 right. distinct prophecies about the first well, coming I grew up all in came an true. A millennial church, and we were taught that the Bible means exactly what it says from the beginning to the end, unless it's talking about the second coming, and it never means what it says. <laughs> How did they justify that? Well, that's a good question. I also one time was reading a book, and, it, and the author said, now this was a an academician. He said, I can prove to you that the thousand years in Revelation 20 doesn't mean a thousand years because over in the Psalms there's a Psalm that says that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And certainly there's more than a thousand hills. So that had to be symbolic. Therefore, this has to be symbolic. Well, you can end up with, again, absolute nonsense when you start applying poetic language from the psalm to a very clear narrative description well, of a reign uh, of a thousand the years. The meaning, meaning of words is always determined by context. Exactly right. Plus, he doesn't use like or as when you get to Revelation 20. He bound Satan for a thousand years, not like a thousand years or sort of a thousand years. <laughs> and then, you know, it says again, he shall not deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. And it's where we get the term millennium. millennium well, that leads us to the next 1, question. And these are questions people have sent in. This one says, with regard to the millennium, my church teaches that Jesus is reigning now from heaven. In other words, we're being taught that we are in the millennium right now. What is your response to that? I would ask, since when? In other words, when did that thousand years start if they think we're in it right now? Because if they interpret it literally as a thousand years, there had to be a beginning point and an end point. And I don't see that there's a reign of Jesus Christ being manifest on the earth. In other words, is Satan bound? If he is, he sure has a lot of free reign in the midst of his binding because you can see his uh, manifestation all around the world with descending darkness even as we sit here today. I love what Micah 4, 1 through 3 says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days, the millennial kingdom, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountain. It shall be exalted above the hills. Is Jerusalem exalted today? The people shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob. Is the house of God up on Jerusalem today? And that says they shall walk in our paths. 
for out of Zion the law shall go forth? Is the law of the world coming well, Nathan, out of Jerusalem? Well, Nathan, you obviously just don't understand. Our millennials no. would say immediately that's talking about the church. <laughs> so the church is up on it's top of that mountain. It's not talking about some okay. future kingdom. It's talking about the church. But then couldn't if you interpret it that way, you could make any interpretation you want? Well, that's true. But is the church reigning over all the world? No. No, clearly not. <laughs> and that's another viewpoint. That's the post-millennial viewpoint, yes. the idea that the church will eventually rule the world. Yeah, but I'm going to say it's going on right now. Right. And I always say, well, if it is, Jesus is doing a very, very poor job of it. And Arnold Fruchtenbaum, a Messianic Jew, always says, if we're in the, uh, in the millennium now, then we are living in the slum portion of it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a misinterpretation, Amen. I think. If you go to Cotton Mather, he was a Puritan pastor back in the 1700s, and he said the kingdom of Christ was a four-part kingdom. It was a spiritual kingdom, a providential kingdom, an ecclesiastical kingdom, which it is. The church is over the earth right now the Lord through it. But there's a fourth aspect and that's the Davidic kingdom where Jesus will rule and reign on the seat of David in Jerusalem. And that aspect hasn't been claimed yet, but they will when Jesus returns. And He will rule with a rod of iron, which means all of the, the evil that we see manifest around the world today will not be tolerated. So clearly He is not reigning in that manner right now. Yeah, the Even Bible's, through the church. The Bible says Great that the point. earth will be flooded with righteousness as the waters cover the seas. I don't see that today. No, certainly not. Well, you but, take trips to Israel all the time. You go to the Dead Sea. Oh, Is yes. the Dead Sea, are people fishing in the Dead Sea Excellent and the, the point. cliffs are all green? No. In Ezekiel 40, uh, 47, it prophesies that the Dead Sea in the Millennial Kingdom will but be alive again. That's just symbolic exactly. language for the gospel going out all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> he really loves playing devil's yes, advocate. Yes, he likes it. Well, we should say another advocate than that. But he likes to play the uh, the contrarian in, in a is. sense. The problem is when you when you spiritualize prophecy, then you never know when it's fulfilled. Right. You don't know when it's. And that allows the the interpreter to become the declarer of what the word of God means instead of letting the word of God speak for itself. That's true. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another question. My church teaches that the millennium is future, and will occur on this earth. But it will consist of the church reigning over all the world for a thousand years without the presence of Jesus. Well, that goes back to what Nathan said about being a post uh, millennial, yeah, post -millennial perspective idea. of the church actually gaining ascendancy. I think this was disproven in the last century with World War I. The church thought it was beginning to globalize the, the gospel message and evangelize the world and saw itself as maybe achieving that kind well, of... Well, yeah, that's a good point because yes. at the end of the uh, 19th century, yes. in the 1890s, the church was flooded with articles and magazines and all about how the 20th century was going to be the century of the church. Yes, sir. And the church would take over the world uh, through the uh, proclamation of the gospel. And nearly all Christians were post-millennialists in that yeah. sense. They anticipated that that and was then, about to be fulfilled. Then came World War One and World War Two and the Great Depression and the Cold War, and uh, and suddenly you couldn't find a post millennialist anywhere. No, what, what you find now, today. yeah, what we have now is post modernists who are actually reverting to pagan religion and pagan culture, and even within the last weeks, as we record this program, we have seen in our country a dramatic decline in the impact of the church here. There's been a 12 point drop yep. in 10 years in the number of people in the United States who even identify as being Christian. And that doesn't mean they're Christian. That doesn't mean they're Christian. That's just self-identification. And of course generationally it is dropping precipitously to where the millennial generation today, less than half of them even will claim a faith at all, let alone Christian faith. And so the church is obviously not gaining ascendancy. Well, you know, I was raised in an amillennial church and I was taught amillennialism to the core. And when I first began to really read the Bible and, and believe what it said and realize it says Jesus is coming back to reign for a thousand years, first question in my mind was why? Why would He come back? And, why don't He just do away with this world, take us all to Heaven and be done with it? Why a millennium? Well, there's so many prophecies and promises in the Bible that must be fulfilled for there be a millennial yeah. kingdom. Let's start with Jesus Christ Himself. He was promised to sit on the throne of David mm -hmm. and rule over this earth. Sure, He can do that spirit spiritually through the church and providentially, but the Bible has many prophecies that say Jesus will rule and reign from Jerusalem, that King David will be a, a co-region under Him as like mayor of Jerusalem. There's so many prophecies that say that Jerusalem will become the capital of the world and it will be raised up above the other nations and all the Gentile nations will flow through it. They'll grab the hem of a Jew and say, hey, you're with Jesus. Take us to Jesus. Is that happening today? No. So, you're saying Jesus 
is going to receive the honor and glory during that time that he should have received Amen. the first yes, time he, he came. Will. But, did, but there are other reasons too. There are other reasons. I think one of the things that amillennials kind of seize on is the idea that goes all the way back to some of the, the earlier church fathers, that flesh, that this material world is evil. It's inherently sinful. Greek and so philosophy. Greek philosophy, exactly. And so really spiritualizing away any kind of material world or realm eliminates the, the evil and the sinfulness of the world. But the Lord created the world in perfection. We're told over and over again in Genesis that the world was good. His creation was good. Mankind was declared as being very good. And so when peace, righteousness, and justice floods the world, then even the material world around us, the animal kingdom, the creation itself, will, will be restored to its perfected state. And that is part of God's goodness in the creation. Well, I'm so glad you raised that point because Greek philosophy just invaded the church yes, when it the did. church began to Augustine. be dominated by Gentiles. They brought that Greek philosophy in. But there was another thing too, and that is all the early church fathers were very anti Semitic. And that also propels amillennialism because. The kingdom that is portrayed in the Scriptures, both Old Testament and New, is going to be a Jewish kingdom where Jesus is going to reign from Jerusalem. All the blessings of God are going to go out through the Jewish people. In fact, it says they will be so honored during that time that ten Gentiles will grab hold exactly. of a robe of a Jew and say, can we walk with you because we know God is with you. And these fellows could not accept that. God had washed His hands of the Jews, and there's not going to be any future kingdom there where, 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 where Israel is the prime nation of the world. Well, not only the Jewish nation having all these promises to be fulfilled within that thousand years, but the creation itself is groaning for the return of the Creator, for the restoration of the perfection that He established again in the Garden of Eden, which we will see once again during that millennial reign. And God has also made some promises to the church for that oh, millennial yes, reign. Oh, yes, He has. Those, well, He's got those, to fulfill them. Those Christians who will be resurrected, the church age Christians, you and I at that time period, will rule and reign with Jesus. There are so many promises that the yeah, Lord's our made. glorified bodies, we're going to reign over those who are in natural bodies. Right. So, there will be a, a Jewish priesthood over the earth in their human, physical, earthly bodies. But we will come down and we will reign over the earth in our glorified bodies Every president, every governor, every member of a school board or a city council is going to be a person in a glorified body. So, no wonder the world is going to be flooded with peace, righteousness, and justice. Yeah, the only law will be coming out of Jerusalem and it will be God's law. Yeah. So, uh, this concept that we've just got to spiritualize all this and throw it out. I, in fact, uh, I've also had people tell me there's no mention of the millennium in the Old Testament. <laughs> oh, my. Well, there are many mentions of the kind of world that we can look forward to during the millennium throughout the Old well, Testament. The passage you mentioned, Isaiah 2, it, it describes the millennial reign in detail. Or take uh, Micah uh, also, Micah 4, I believe it was. Uh, same thing. It's described in detail in the Old Testament. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, the famous Christmas passage that prophesies that the governing ship or rulership of the earth will be on the Lord's shoulders. Well, is Jesus here ruling and reigning physically? He is not. not so yet. he needs he didn't a claim. the first that. time either. Not no, yet. he did not. No. So all of that has to be fulfilled. Right. And it's going right. to be fulfilled in a millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Well, folks, uh, we're going to take a brief break. And when we come back, we'll pick up where we left off. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy and our discussion of the millennial reign of Jesus. We are in the process of affirming that the Bible teaches that Jesus is going to return to this earth to reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years. This is called the premillennial viewpoint. So, okay, Dave, what is your next <laughs> question for us to try to stump us? Well, the next question is kind of an intriguing one, and that is that when we ended that last session, we were talking about that during the millennial reign of Jesus, those of us in glorified bodies, the believers, are going to be reigning over those in natural bodies. So, the question begins to emerge as to who in the world are those people? Because when the rapture occurs, all church age believers, living and dead, are going to be given glorified bodies. When Jesus returns at the second coming, He's going to resurrect the Old Testament saints and the tribulation martyrs. They'll receive their glorified bodies. So, who are we going to reign over? That's a good question. But through the tribulation period, there will be people who are able to endure and who survive that terrifically horrible period of time and enter the millennial reign of Jesus Christ in mortal bodies. 
and they will then have children, their children will have children to repopulate the earth. So those living people who are still mortal will go into the millennial so the reign. survivors of the tribulation the survivors, who are believers. Who are believers. Because there will be survivors who are not believers. Oh yes. And they, they will be condemned to death and to Hades. But the ones who survive who are believers, both Jew and Gentile, will be allowed to go in the millennium in the flesh. That's going to be a very small number of people. Relative to the world today, yes it will. But they will repopulate in very quick order. Yeah, when you read about the sheep goat judgment in Matthew 25, how at the after the second coming, at the end of the tribulation, the Lord gathers all the people together for a judgment, and they fit in the valley of Jehoshaphat. So we're talking about they got enough. the 144,000, you got the Jews protected in the wilderness, but that's there's not many people. But think about what the millennial kingdom must be like if you don't have sickness and disease, and the lifespans go as long as a tree, so like a thousand years. What would the population, I had once read that one theologian estimated that by the end of the thousand years there could be 20 billion people living on this planet. And with the bounty there's no scarcity or want, everybody has plenty of food. And I just love this uh, Daniel 7, 18, But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Amen. And as a Christian you ought to say, Hallelujah, because yeah. that is a wonderful prophecy. And again in verse 27 it says the same thing, Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven, kingdoms, plural, nations, shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey Him. So we know then during the Millennial Kingdom there will be nations the people who survived the tribulation will split out and form countries again. We know that Egypt and Assyria will be nations again. Israel, of course, the prime nation of the world, uh, talks about Russia, a second Gog and Magog war at the end of the tribulation. So those four nations we know exist there but too. But the millennium will begin on, with people in the flesh, they'll all be believers. Right. And yes. then they'll begin to propagate. And uh, one of the things that you mentioned I think we ought to emphasize is that Micah chapter 4 says that uh, people will live as long as a tree. And the indication of the Scriptures is that the lifespan of man will be returned to what it was at the beginning when men lived like a thousand years. And um, if that happens then certainly we are going to have a tremendous population explosion. Yeah, yes, I mean, you wouldn't will. be limited to your 30s, 20s and 30s to have children. You could might be having children up to 100 or 200. Right, Can you right. imagine how yeah. many? Yes. So, uh, uh, quickly another uh, question that arises then is uh, what, what are going to be some of the characteristics of the Millennium? Well, I think there's a number of different kind of characteristics that we have to consider. I mean, there will be spiritual bounty and blessing as the Lord reigns from Jerusalem. The world will be flooded with peace and righteousness. I mean, it says that even the bells on the horses' bridles, the pots in the kitchens will say, Holy unto the Lord. In other words, everything, tenors. exactly, everything will be set apart as holy for God. With that kind of righteousness, you can just imagine there's no crime, there's no injustice, there, there's no sin anywhere in the world. Now, for those people who have entered as believers, they will be looking forward to that kind of life because they will have endured seven years of great terror during the tribulation. Their children and grandchildren will grow up in a world not knowing any of the darkness that we see today. But some of them, sadly, will not be eager to subject themselves to the Lord's reign. And so they will be the ones who will eventually revolt against Him in those second wars of Gog and Magog at the end of millennium. But spiritually the world will be flooded with peace and righteousness we can only and imagine. Justice. And oh, justice. Yes. yes. I love Jeremiah 31, 13. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance of the young men and the old together, for I will turn their mourning to joy, will comfort them, and make them rejoice rather than sorrow. I mean, I love to preach about the millennial kingdom because it is a time that that is our home. We might consider, you know, where you live your home, but this is a temporary home. Our future home is the millennial kingdom and then into the eternal state. Well, I, I don't think it would be Exactly correct, though, to say that there will be no crime during that time because uh, you are going to have people in the flesh. Right. And the flesh is going to want what the flesh wants. And what I think is going to happen is that when people violate the law of God, there won't be legislatures, there will be the law of God. And uh, when they violate it, they will be arrested immediately, they will be tried immediately, there will be no appeal because that judge is going to have a, it be in a glorified body with the mind of Christ. Justice will be swift, justice will be certain, justice will be for sure. In fact, it indicates in Micah that if a person uh, is rebellious, 
that they won't live beyond the age of 100. Very and, and it's not that, quite you know what all that means. but That's a good case. point because even as I am uh, watching the raising of grandchildren now, I realize that children have to be taught yeah. and they have to be admonished. And so they have a sinful nature within themselves that wants to rebel against parents. And as the world is repopulated, children will have to be taught. So you're exactly right. Crime itself will not be eliminated. But it will be certainly... <laughs> but it will be tamped down and it will be corrected immediately. Well, some also, people say, how can there be any evil during the millennium? Because uh, Satan's going to be uh, 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 tied up during that time. Uh, He's going to be chained. So, how can there be any evil? Well, that is a proof that evil is not just external to mankind. It's in our very heart. Yes. Yes. It is inside us. And that will be what happens and what is demonstrated in not great finality at the end of the millennial reign. Okay, That's the so true that tragedy of the millennial kingdom, though. The release of Satan. And people say, well, why release Satan? into?" It's like letting a serpent into a, a daycare center, you know. Right. But when it says that Satan will lead an army against Jerusalem to, uh, once last time to try to overthrow Jesus, that people beyond count will follow Him. They will turn. I mean, this is a true tragedy that you could have a utopian society and all these children that are born of the tribulation saints will follow Jesus in an attempt to overthrow well, Him. Well, John Milton wrote in Paradise Lost uh, a phrase attributed to Satan, but there will be many people who will share this philosophy. Better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. Wow. People will live in a heavenly kind of environment with perfect peace and righteousness and justice, but even then they'll realize, I'm serving someone, Jesus Christ, and perhaps not willingly. So, given the opportunity and half a chance, they will seek to rebel. I and that's very that during tragic. the millennial reign, when people see that justice is swift and certain and sure, that what you'll have is people saying, we love you, Jesus, with their teeth clenched, because they want everything that the evil nature mm -hmm. wants. And so, at the end of that time, when Satan is released, He'll have a whole bunch of people ready for rebellion. Yes, he will. We even see that when the nations are supposed to go up at least once a year to, to Jerusalem yes. and see Jesus. Jesus wants to connect with his people. Yes. And we read about how Egypt at some point is going to say, eh, we're not going up. And the Lord shuts off the rain until they finally repent and come to see him. So we already see a little bit of rebellion during that time period. Have you ever thought about the fact that history goes in a circle here? It begins with two people in a perfect environment and they rebel. It ends with all of humanity in a perfect rebellion, and humanity rebels. I think God is trying to prove, and will prove, that humanism is absolutely wrong, because humanism is basically the religion of the world. It goes under many different names. But it's the belief in man. And it's a belief that man can be perfected. And it's a belief that all the sin in the world is due to society, not man. And if we can just perfect society, right. Man will be perfected. No, the Bible says the problem is man. The problem is the evil nature of man. And that uh, the only thing that can change that is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Well, evil nature, not nurture. But speaking of nature, there's one other thing that a lot of people mistake our very namesake here at Lamb and Lion Ministry as part of the millennial <laughs> reign. Uh, and that comes from Isaiah chapter 65, verse 25, when it says, The wolf and the lamb will lie down together, and eat, <laughs> the lion will eat straw like the ox, the dust will be the serpent's food, and there will be no evil or harm in all my holy mountain. And so the animal kingdom, again, creation being restored. And that is what the Lord promises to all of creation, yes. like the Garden of Eden. But again, folks, it will be the wolf and the lamb, not the lamb and the lion. That is a picture of Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know, we have people argue with us about I that. Know. They'll write and they'll say, now I know it says somewhere where the lion will lie down with the lamb, and that's the name of your ministry, so where is it? And I say, it's not there. It's so, not there. And they'll say, no, it's there. I get a Christmas card every year with a picture on <laughs> it. <laughs> Those lions, though, are going to be the most depressed animals during the Millennial King. Can you imagine a lion sitting there chewing straw and looking at the sheep going by? <laughs> ah, now, see, but they're restored to their proper perfection. So. One of my all-time favorite uh, <laughs> religious cartoon shows uh, uh, during the millennium this lion is sitting under a tree and he's reading a book and there's a little lamb next to him just leaning over sleeping. Oh. And the title of the book is Veggie Recipes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, that's a question. Are we going to be eating meat or are we going to be vegetarian during that time? I love the verses that talk about how the 
the person who's planting will pass the, the, the one who's uh, reaping will actually surpass and pass the person who's planting. Yeah. In other words, that the crops are coming up so abundantly that you can't keep up with it. It's, it's well, a, I've, I've been noted that uh, anybody that makes a vegetable burger always says it tastes <laughs> like meat. No. They don't make te meat that tastes like broccoli. So you know what? It seems <laughs> like uh, they're going to still have well, I have a question for you then, Dr. Reagan, because we get this all the time. Uh -huh. Why are there sacrifices during the Millennial Kingdom? Well, uh, that's a very complicated thing and many different uh, opinions on it. Uh, I hope we have the time to answer your question. Uh, one one uh, approach to that, and many people take this position, is that uh, these sacrifices that will be offered at the Millennial Temple will be sacrifices like uh, reminding people of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. They're a remembrance process uh, very similar to what communion is today reminds us of the cross. And uh, so that is one of the major positions that's taken. Another one is that it all relates to the fact that there will be Gentiles and there will be Jews who are unsaved during this time and that they have to go through certain cleansing processes to even go on the Temple Mount and enter the Temple. I don't know. All I know is the Bible says that that will be the case. And they're certainly not sacrifices to save people's souls. They're either, either for cleansing uh, for ritual cleansing, or else they relate to remembrance of the cross. So the whole world population yeah. won't be having so sacrifices. Well, I think the ritual of purification for the priests yeah. makes sense. We're not talking about there wouldn't be any animals left on the earth if all 20 billion people had to have sacrifices. Well, for and them. I think it's almost a first fruits giving over to the Lord, yeah. whether it's bounty of crops or if we do uh, consume animals, giving over to Him a first fruits just out of recognition and honoring. Someone's of watching him. and wondering, how in the world can I participate in this millennial reign? Tell them. Well, to participate in the millennial reign, what you need to do is you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Not just Savior, but let Him reign now as Lord. We know He's going to reign as Lord in Jerusalem during the millennial reign, but He can do so right now by you giving your life to Him today. And when you do, you are guaranteed to enter that millennial kingdom in a glorified body and reign with Jesus Christ. Well, folks, that's our program for this week. I hope it's been a blessing to you, and I hope the Lord willing you'll be with, back with us next week. Until then, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, Look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. If you found this program interesting, we would suggest you order a copy of our newest video album, Questions and Answers About Bible Prophecy. The album contains two DVD discs that feature seven television programs in which Dr. David Reagan, Colonel Tim Moore, and our internet evangelist, Nathan Jones, answer questions sent into the ministry by our television audience. The first two programs concern the validity of the Bible and Bible prophecy in general. These are followed by five programs that respond to specific Bible prophecy questions regarding the signs of the times, the rapture, the tribulation, the millennium, and eternity. Each of the programs run about 25 minutes in length and each program could be used as a starter for a group discussion of the topic. The total running time of all the programs is approximately 175 minutes. The album can be yours for a gift of $20 or more, including the cost of shipping. Just call our ministry at the number you see on the screen Monday through Friday between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Central Time or place your order through our website at lamblion.com. This album contains answers to the most frequently asked questions about Bible prophecy. Again, the album can be yours for a gift of $20 or more, including the cost of shipping. Just call our ministry Monday through Friday between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Central Time and ask for item number D83. Or place your order through our website at lamblion.com. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus.